Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute's 2021 Foster Youth Internship Congressional Briefing. We are so happy to have you here this afternoon. Um, our class of FYIs um, have been incredible and spent not only this summer, but last summer as well um, in the Foster Youth Internship Program, um, our first class ever to have a two-year commitment working hard on building their legislative knowledge um, and advocacy skills um, and empowerment um, as child welfare advocates. We have an amazing class of 11 this year in 2021. Alan, Autumn, Cortez, Haley, Isabel, Layla Rose, Michaela, Chanel, Ian, Junelli, and Tashe are all on today and look forward to sharing their recommendations for federal policy change in the child welfare system. I would now like to introduce our wonderful board chair and founding co-chair of CCAI, Senator Mary Landrew. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's so wonderful to see our um, amazing interns again. I had the opportunity to visit with you guys virtually at least once or twice and looking forward to hearing your stories and um, guidance and suggestions, your legislative uh, reports in just uh, a little bit. And I'm so glad that you all got to meet each other and I hope you'll continue to have a strong supportive network for yourselves moving forward. Um, but let me first begin by thanking Kate uh, McLean and Taylor Drady, two of our amazing leaders at CCAI who stepped in at a very difficult and challenging time for so many organizations, large and small, for-profit and not-for-profit through COVID, trying to keep all of our programs and activities and moving forward, working with members of Congress when their offices were closed, trying to work with staff when they weren't in DC, trying to set up and keep so many of our programs running. We're very proud of the work that our coalition uh, has done over now 20 years, working with members of Congress in both the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat. Um, we must always remember our four co-chairs in the Senate, Amy Klobuchar, Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota, Roy Blunt from Missouri, Rob Adderholt, um from Alabama in the House, and Adam Smith from Washington State um, in the House. And our four co-chairs, helped to organize the work of over 150 members of Congress. And at a time when things are very tense and there's not much bipartisanship going on, despite the good work of the infrastructure group, which we all have hopes for, will work out a compromise. It's tough. And we are very proud of the work we continue to do to promote the idea of safe and stable families for every child and young person and opportunities for every child that's been in the foster care system and try to prevent uh, foster care if possible by strengthening families. And then of course, adoption on the end when re reunification is impossible. And it's complicated work as the interns themselves know who have lived uh, this tough life and their stories and their experience have a lot to share for members that are elected uh, here in Washington. So I wanna thank the staff, of course, Kate and Taylor, our leadership, and also our board. Some of our board members will be joining today. Uh, some of them have served for many years on this board, um, giving much time and their skills, skill set to help us grow and expand the organization's reach. And finally, we can't do anything without our partners um, that contribute funds, substantial funds, to underwrite this amazing program. The American Council of Life Insurers, American Retirement Association, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Arnold and Porter Law Firm, uh, Both Ends Believing, which is, goes by B&B &B now, a great organization, it's doing tremendous work. Brownstein Law Firm, Carlson Family Foundation, Child Focus, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption that has been one of the founding um, members and sponsors and supporters of this organization for over 20 years, Retail Orphan Initiative, another longtime supporter, and individuals like Rita Lewis, Susan Hirschman, Susan Neely, and then the Williams and Jensen Law Firm. So it takes a lot of funding to support our FYI program. Normally our interns, which you all will meet today, 
come to Washington and spend the whole summer. This is a special group. They have stuck with us and we with them, not for one year, but for two. They haven't been able to get to Washington in person because of COVID, not because we didn't try every way we could to get them here. But still, they're not having meetings in some of the offices and a lot of the buildings aren't open. But anyway, we've had a very robust program. I just will end by just thanking everyone again for everything you've done, particularly Kate and Taylor, our team and, um, and our own internal interns for helping make this program as meaningful and robust um, as we can for these young people. We wish you all the very best in your future educational opportunities, your future leadership opportunities. And at some point when you come to Washington, come knock on our door. We'd love to shake hands and see you guys in person. But until then, I'll turn it back over to Kate. Um, we're looking forward to a great program this afternoon. So thank you all so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Senator, for your leadership. Um, and now I would like to turn it over to one of our incredible Foster Youth interns. Um, this one from Alabama, currently studying at The Ohio State University, Layla Rose, um, to kick off our briefing and introduce um, the 2021 policy report, Building the Path Forward for Change in the Child Welfare System. Good afternoon. Congress members, congressional staff, child welfare organizations, family, friends, and other esteemed guests. My name is Layla Rose Hudson, and I, on behalf of the 2021 class of Boston Youth Interns, would like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today, virtually. It has been my honor and privilege this summer to work alongside 10 extremely impressive and accomplished individuals who have bravely defied all the odds stacked against them. With that being said, the only problem is that my cohort and I dream of a world where success is the rule and not the exception for those whose lives are touched by the child welfare system. We advocate for a country where fewer people experience a childhood that they must spend their adulthood recovering from. The COVID-19 public health crisis shed light on multiple systemic failures that many of us were already intimately familiar with. This is why our 2021 policy report topic is building the path forward for change in the child welfare system. Our lived experiences in the system have impacted almost every aspect of our lives. Today, through our firsthand accounts, you will hear 11 carefully researched opportunities for change, 11 ways to cure some of the inequities that we have witnessed and experienced personally. The children of this country are both our future and our responsibility. So it is our sincerest hope that you will take our stories and use them to create a better world for the generations that come after us again. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. I will now turn it over to my colleagues to present their research and policy recommendations. Hi, and thank you, Layla Rose, for the introduction. The Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA, is federal legislation intended to protect the best interests of Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. Or in other words, at a minimum, ensure that when an Indian child is removed from their home, their connection to their culture and community are prioritized. ICWA has impacted my life as a tribal member and an individual. During my formative years, I lived in my grandmother's home, which allowed me to maintain connection to my culture and family. Every day I was surrounded by our culture. I was sung to sleep in our language, <laughs> even though I knew when she was hollering at me in that same language, I was in deep trouble. <laughs> I learned how to gather and prepare our, our traditional foods. Although I'm sure I ate far more huckleberries than I picked. I was able to be raised by our oral histories and our stories and the lessons embedded within them since time immemorial. The strength and teachings I received during my formative years have allowed me to continually break systematic barriers and overcome the intergenerational trauma stemming from the damaging impact colonization has had on indigenous people. I firmly believe ICWA saved my life. 
The passage of ICWA in 1978 was monumental in ensuring American Indian and Alaska Native children maintained family and tribal connections. However, there have been many attempts to dismantle ICWA. The most recent decision led to an en blanc Fifth Circuit hearing in January of 2020, a hearing I was able to attend. The Fifth Circuit decision released in April of 2021 stating ICWA was not a race-based law, but a law based on political identification was great. However, it also declared ICWA as commandeering state resources. It is imperative there's a federal legislative fix to the court decision to reconfirm ICWA's mandated active efforts to better preserve the law's intention of keeping Native families and communities together. Congress should require states to provide and finance appropriate efforts in order to prevent the breakup of Indian families as a condition of child welfare funding under Title IV-E. Appropriate efforts could be defined as the affirmative, active, and thorough and timely efforts intended primarily to maintain or reunite an Indian child with his or her family. Adding the appropriate active efforts requirement to Title IV-E will directly connect federal child welfare funding to state implementation of active efforts and other ICWA requirements. Clarifying the allotment of federal funding to implement active efforts will remove the court's argument that state resources are being commandeered. This addition is imperative to ensure effective implementation of, act of the Indian Child Welfare Act and to preservation of indigenous families. Thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to pass it to my colleague. Thank you so much, Autumn. I'm going to jump in here because we have a very special guest that has joined us, the great Senator from Connecticut, Senator Blumenthal. He hosted one of our Foster Youth interns, Alan, this summer, um, and I know has been such a great champion uh, for the Foster Youth Internship Program over the years. So it's great to see you, Senator, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, really honored and excited to be on with you and my former wonderful, absolutely terrific colleague, Senator Mary Landrew, who actually first got me involved and interested in this wonderful program. I have been involved with CCAI for a number of years. We've had other interns. Alan is one of our really best and brightest. He was raised, as you probably know, in Montville, Connecticut, it's a small town in the eastern part of our state. And then he went to Central Connecticut, which is one of our uh, state universities and excelled there as well. And he worked as an intern, his period of service ended on July 23rd, but he has done just remarkable work. And over the years, the interns who have been involved in the summer program have really not only benefited themselves, but also have opened our eyes and given us new understanding and perspective about what they've been through, what the challenges are concerning adoption, what more we can do to make adoption work better, all of the rights and interests that are at stake. They've really given us invaluable depth and breadth in understanding the work that's involved here. I am uh, really pleased to kind of be the introductory act, but I just want to express my appreciation to CCAI because you're doing absolutely spectacular work and it is a remarkable public service. Uh, Mary Landrew has been a steadfast champion over many years. She's involved her colleagues uh, like myself. She's been really not only a cheerleader, but a, a real worker in this effort. And she has believed and she's enlisted many of us to understand as well, the importance of all of these adoption issues. So uh, with great enthusiasm and appreciation, I turn it back to the program and uh, Alan, thank you so much for all the great work that you've done in our office. Everybody loves you. We're sorry to see you go. And we hope you'll stay in touch and come back and visit uh, here or I maybe I'll see you in Montville one of these days or in Connecticut elsewhere. So um, I'm really proud, uh, Alan, of the great work that you've been doing. And I'll turn, turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Senator. It was really an honor to really uh, be in this internship in your office this summer. I learned so much. Hello, my name is Alan Alboutin. I'm from New Britain, Connecticut and graduating next semester from Central Connecticut State University with a degree in communications and minor in social justice. I'm beyond thankful to rejoin my cohort as a first ever group of returning CCAI FII interns. It is an honor to share my individual experiences with you all today. My parents adopted me when I was five years old. I can still remember wrapping my tiny fingers around the enormous wooden gavel in the mayor's office waiting for him to say, when you strike this gavel, you will officially be a part of the Abutin family. Although at the time, I had not fully comprehended what it meant to be adopted, I was equally as excited to slam the gavel against the sounding block as it meant I was finally wanted by a family. My early childhood memories with my adoptive family were filled with joy, laughter, and love, which were polar opposites of the memories I had become accustomed to at previous foster home. My sisters went back and forth between grandparents and other family, while my brother lived periodically with different friends of my mother's. I ended up in the foster care system bouncing from home to home before finally being adopted. It is hard to balance being grateful for the circumstances you have been given while being left yearning for what is missing. I used to lay awake at night creating happy memories in my mind of what it would be like if my siblings and I stayed together just so I could distract myself from the loneliness I felt without them. A family tree is an experience that relies on the strength of its roots. How am I supposed to know who I am without my siblings to branch out to? I only see my sisters during Christmas and only see my brother on rare occasions. The last time I saw him was two years ago when I went to get a haircut and he happened to be at the barber's too. Even then, we did not speak for long. I often feel guilty for having the opportunities my adoptive family gave me, knowing my siblings were not able to have them. Perhaps if we had been together through my adoption, our bonds would be much stronger and would be able to communicate and grow from our trauma together. My story is not unique. 471,000 children in foster care have siblings and unfortunately, 160,000 are separated from their siblings because of placement. This is why I recommend Congress amend the Fostering Connections to Success and Increasing Adoptions Act to replicate California law, which establishes post-adoption contact agreements at the benefit and best interest of the child. Further, it is important to also replicate California's regulations, which in part enhances post-adoption connections by requiring adequate assessment of whether the child would benefit from continuing contact with members of his or her extended family after adoption. Congress should then define and create a national resource of best practices for the preservation and restoration of sibling connection activities, such as prioritizing sibling visitation with transportation to and from visits, age appropriate activities, virtual visits and family counseling services. Finally, Congress should authorize the use of Title IV-B funds to pay for preservation and restorative sibling connection activities for current and former foster and adoptive youth to ensure sibling connections are maintained throughout the entirety of the adoption process. We cannot be products of our environment. We have to produce the environment we want to be in. And the only way we do that is by doing it together. We need to create better opportunities for siblings to maintain their relationships so they have a better shot at a brighter future. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal, I think you're still on mute. Thank you so much, Alan. That was really uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, thank you uh, all of you for having me, having us, on this call and good luck to everyone. Awesome, thank you, Senator, for joining us today. We also have another very special guest that's joining us um, from the great state of Kansas, Representative Davids. Um, she rushed over from House Votes to be here uh, with us this afternoon and she hosted um, one of our FOSS Youth interns this summer, Chanel. So uh, Representative Davids, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad to be joining all of you. And uh, I'm really glad that I was able to um, uh, get over here. I wore my tennis shoes today, so I made it pretty quick on the way back from the House floor. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm also really glad, Alan, that I got to hear 
uh, that I was on here to listen to your um, presentation and and story. Um, I guess I first of all, congratulations to everybody for your hard work and um, and just like making the most of uh, making the most of all of this uh, over the summer. And I know that the the skills, um, whether we're talking about researching, um, assisting folks, uh, it it makes a huge difference, not just um, in terms of learnings, but uh, you know, on whatever career path you choose, but also it it really makes a huge difference in um, the lives of the people that you've been helping, which is like a pretty phenomenal thing. Um, I and Chanel, I see your little box on here. It's good to see you. Uh, and um, we've really, really enjoyed um, you know having uh, having you here in our office um, right now and. Uh, obviously, I think all of us wish we could see each other in real life, um, in person, um, but having the opportunity to do this uh, virtually um, is uh, the next best thing. Um, I know I won't, I haven't, I wasn't able to stay on for too long, but I just want to say how much I appreciate all of you, um, your efforts, your uh, willingness to um, share your experiences and stories with folks because it makes a huge difference. Um, and uh, just one quick note, just for folks who um, might not uh, know this, my, my mom is actually adopted. Um, my mom and uh, my two of my um, aunts and all the rest of my aunts and uncles, there's nine of them total, uh, grew up in the, uh, in the system. And so um, I just know that uh, some of what Alan was saying really resonates um, uh, with what I've seen in my own family. So um, I appreciate you guys. And then I'll turn it back over. All right. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Sharice Davids. It has been so fun working in your office this summer. Your leadership has truly been inspiring. And I was just telling the um, other interns yesterday how much I've learned working in your office. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chanel LaValle. I am from the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation in Montana. My tribal affiliations are Aani and Nakota. Recently, the remains of indigenous children have been discovered in Canada at former residential boarding schools. Their, de their deaths undocumented and graves unmarked. These schools are not only a history that impacts Canada's indigenous people, but our indigenous people in the United States too. Residential schools were established in the early 1800s through the mid 1900s as a way to assimilate indigenous children into westernized culture. Consequently, these schools forcibly separated tribal communities from their children and stripped tribal children of their families, languages, and culture. After the recent discoveries in Canada, Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland called for an investigation of former residential school sites in the United States to see if there are any other remains. Tribal communities have fought long and hard to revitalize indigenous culture and tribal youth, our future, are the key to keeping our culture alive. The abuse my people endured continues to show up through the separation, neglect, and disproportionate overrepresentation of indigenous children in the foster care system. And my indigenous peers and youth in the child welfare system have been exposed to a similar type of trauma our ancestors endured in residential schools. Indigenous children are overrepresented in foster care at a rate that is 2.84 times their population nationally. This varies by state, but in my state of Montana, there are around 10% of indigenous children in the general population, but nearly 33% in foster care. To ensure all indigenous youth have the opportunity to thrive, tribal communities must have the power to decide what is best for our children's welfare and the child welfare system must honor our culture and values. I recommend Congress to require the Children's Bureau to first establish an advisory board of tribal foster youth elders and other indigenous community representatives to develop strategies to ad address racial equity and the overrepresentation of indigenous children and youth in the child welfare system. 
2022, released a report every two years that comprehensively studies the data on how tribal foster youth are doing in the system. And finally, three, conduct an annual survey of tribal foster youth to determine if tribal foster youth needs are being met and their rights upheld. Helping our indigenous, feel, our indigenous youth feel valued is what drives me in this work so that one day they can wake up and feel secure, safe, and supported in a system in a world that is designed to help them. It is time that we listen to Indigenous youth, support Indigenous youth, include Indigenous youth, teach Indigenous youth, and most importantly, invest in Indigenous youth. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Cortez Carey. I'm actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, but I currently reside uh, right outside of DC. Um, assumptions others have made about me have ruled my world for many years. Uh, I've been put on a pedestal by those who believe I have it all together uh, or told my life is a dream come true for a former foster youth. But what they fail to realize is I still struggle with my experiences as a foster child that stem from being separated from my siblings uh, for most of my life. At times, what my educational success looks like externally is the complete opposite of what it feels like internally, which I now understand derives from the big unknown question from my childhood, what will my relationships with my brothers and sisters look like had I been placed in a stable home alongside of them? I am the fifth born of my biological mother's six children. Um, not knowing who or how many siblings I had was a completely normal reality for me growing up. I was in the first grade when I had the chance to meet my younger brother and thought, another brother? I feared the great unknown. Are there others? Would we look the same? Would he look like me? Would he like me? In this case, my younger brother and I shared the same parents and so the same face too. The moment I met my brother, I felt like the greatest connection I had ever experienced. Today, that feeling still remains. No matter the mountains we climbed throughout our time together, we climbed them as a family unit. That was until we were removed from our kinship placement due to what the system ruled as inadequate space. My grandmother lived in a small two bedroom apartment and instead of supplying her with the appropriate resources, time and assistance to obtain a larger living space, they removed me and my siblings and separated us again. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, sibling relationships are critically important, not only in childhood, but over the course of a lifetime. And those who have positive relationships with their siblings are less likely to experience anxiety, depression and behavior problems. Once my siblings and I were split up, we unfortunately went a long time without seeing or speaking to one another. After reuniting years later, it was clear our relationships were strained and we currently still have a lot of work to do. As a professional who has studied social work in, at the master's level, I can understand from both a personal and academic perspective, how a child maintaining a relationship with their siblings while in foster care is a critical protective factor for their mental health. Although Congress has made strides with the fostering connections to success in increasing adoptions act of 2008, I believe there is more work to do. Congress should create a housing fund for states to cover eligible expenses for kin and non kin foster families who do not have enough space in their current housing to meet federal and state requirements to ensure more siblings can be kept together. Not only are their relationships with their family and each other at stake, but their mental health as well. There is no way to change my past, but together we can make a positive impact on the future of these children if we invest more time and resources into maintaining sibling relationships. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining my colleagues and I for today's briefing. My name is Haley D'Elia and I am a graduate of Rowan University with a bachelor's in mathematics and sociology. A few months before I was set to age out of foster care, I began searching for therapists who were covered by Medicaid. In my state of New Jersey, youth are given a list of mental health providers and told to figure out the rest themselves. 
services were very limited as the two options were either therapy in a large group setting, or I could call at the first of the month to possibly reserve a session. The locations and hours of services required me to take off from school or work. This is why Congress should refine language in the Timely Mental Health for Foster Youth Act to mandate an additional mental health screening conducted at least 60 days before youth age out of foster care. Also, Congress should require caseworkers to help connect youth with therapeutic aftercare services as a part of their transitional living plan. The breadth of necessary and flexible mental health resources is not covered through Medicaid. The system gives youth an impossible ultimatum to either earn an education and work to pay their bills or seek healing. Current law poses barriers to do all of this at once. To offer adequate coverage and flexible services, Congress should amend the DOSHA Joy Immediate Coverage for Former Foster Youth Act and the Expanded Coverage for Former Foster Youth Act to include explicit language stating that Medicaid covers individual and telehealth therapy services for current and former foster youth. Children and youth in foster care experience significant trauma before, during, and after their experience in care. More than 80% of foster youth have mental health issues, including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, social phobia, panic disorder, and anxiety, among others. They also face a unique type of trauma called ambiguous loss as a result of being physically separated from their biological families, communities, resource providers, and schools. There is no shared vocabulary for recognizing ambiguous loss within the child welfare system because it is simply accepted as a natural consequence of foster care. This is why it is imperative that Congress require professionals who work in child welfare, such as social workers, health clinicians, and the legal community to be adequately trained in the National Adoption Competency Mental Health Training Initiative, NTI, that specifically addresses ambiguous loss. Finally, Healing is a desired outcome for youth managing loss, but it is not something that we have operationalized in the child welfare system. Therefore, to hold states accountable in helping youth in their healing processes, Congress should mandate the National Youth and Transition Database measure outcomes for healing and trauma through a qualitative question that allows youth to identify the types of support needed to address their mental health and healing needs. As a nation, we have the responsibility to help youth who have experienced care so that they can live full and meaningful lives. Youth in foster care deserve and are worthy of healing, but we have to make mental health services accessible, flexible, and equip our child welfare workers with the training and required assessments needed to help youth not only survive, but thrive. I would like to thank Senator Menendez, CCAI, and all in attendance today. To read my full policy recommendations, go to page 15 of our report. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isabel Goodrich, and I am so thankful to be here with all of you today. Youth in foster care have experienced massive trauma from being removed from their families, becoming homeless, or experiencing other forms of instability. This is especially true for foster youth of color who also face the additional trauma of racism. Unfortunately, Black students in foster care are often labeled as disruptive or troubled when in reality, their behavior is a direct manifestation of the trauma that they have endured. Instead of being met with compassion from their teachers, oftentimes these students are met with disciplinary actions that worsen their trauma and increase the gap to academic success. To address the needs of young people who have experienced trauma with particular attention to black youth in foster care, Congress can help make schools a truly supportive environment through creating a model curriculum for current and future teachers and improving hiring and training practices. As a future teacher, I am constantly reminded that education is supposed to be the great equalizer. Sadly, this is not always the case. I was in high school when I came into foster care and I faced many obstacles that made it difficult for me to complete my schoolwork or to even want to go to school. Luckily, I had a teacher who recognized my struggles. She never tried to fix me, but she did try to help me find a path towards success. If it were not for her, I would not be here, let alone with a high school diploma. My teacher was a pristine example of what all teachers should strive to be, caring, understanding, and loving. As a student in care, I know that the misconceptions that were placed upon me must be even worse for Black students. We must address the hindrances to success of Black students in foster care, including everything from higher rates of disciplinary action to underrepresentation in the classroom. 
The data has shown that Black children are both disproportionately represented in the foster care and juvenile justice systems and experience significantly higher rates of disciplinary action in comparison to their white counterparts. As a result, Black students in foster care already start off on an unequal playing field, leading to greater levels of educational disparities. In 2020, the UCLA Black Male Institute released a brief highlighting these disparities in Los Angeles public schools. Specifically, Black foster students disproportionately experience punitive discipline, are suspended at a rate of 17% in comparison to the overall LA County rate of 2%, and have the highest representation in special education placements at 37%. The study underscores the universal need for increased trauma-informed training and supports to help schools meet the needs of similar populations of students across the country. In order to provide all educators with the tools needed to help students heal from trauma and create truly trauma-informed schools, Congress should one, create a demonstration program through the Department of Education that allows school districts to develop strategies to ensure trauma-informed knowledge is integrated into hiring processes for teachers. The strategies tested through these demonstration projects can then be shared and replicated by other school districts across the country to ensure all incoming teachers are trauma-informed educators. Finally, Congress can too increase funding for Title II of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which may be used by school districts to provide in-service training for school personnel on how to address the needs of students impacted by trauma. Thank you all so much. Good afternoon. Once again, my name is Layla Rose Hudson, and I am a rising third year law student at The Ohio State University. Before I begin, I would like to provide a brief content warning. I'm about to discuss very difficult topics, including child sexual abuse and suicide. When I was 12 years old, I thought I was pregnant. Now, I didn't quite understand the full mechanics of reproduction, but I knew my foster father had done things to me that could result in pregnancy. I didn't have anyone I could tell. I disclosed to a friend at school who reported on my behalf, but my social workers brushed me off saying that my past trauma had given me a tendency to fabricate, despite me having no history of lying about abuse. I remember scraping pocket change together to buy a home test, terrified of the very adult decisions I would have to make if it was positive. Thankfully, I was not pregnant, but I was trapped in a situation with no foreseeable way out. See, my foster father was the type of man you might sit next to in church, stern, old fashioned, full of dad jokes. He didn't come with a warning label, I, by virtue of being a foster child, came with many. Mine ensured I would cry myself to sleep for the better part of two years. My foster father took his own life the night before I was slated to testify at trial against a member of my biological family for child abuse. He named me in his note, so I was suddenly swarmed with questions but no official investigation was ever conducted because no one wanted to upset the widow or other members of the surviving family. My experience sadly is not unique. If you look at the official data, you'd think that only roughly 0.4% of foster youth nationwide experience maltreatment while in foster care. As many people involved with the child welfare system can attest, 0.4% has never match the voices of lived experience. I personally know others whose maltreatment was never reported or investigated. Multiple qualitative studies have found that as many as one in three foster youth are maltreated during their time in the system. Like mine, their stories are left behind by the available official data. It is impossible to protect vulnerable foster youth when the official data does not reflect reality. Today, I am asking Congress to allocate funds through the CAPTA Reauthorization Act of 2021 to incentivize states to create or maintain an independent youth-specific ombudsman office that functions as a maltreatment reporting resource, resource and publishes data and recommendations publicly. In addition, 
specific questions about maltreatment and foster care should be added to existing qualitative surveys, such as the National Youth in Transition Database or the National Survey of Child and Adolescent Wellbeing, or alternatively, a new youth survey that specifically addresses maltreatment and foster care should be created. By taking these steps, we can begin to create a safer world with better outcomes for foster youth. But we will not see change if we continue to silence the maltreated. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michaela James, and I've spent the last nine years as an advocate for child welfare reform. Throughout this journey, I've often been asked if I could choose one thing to change within the foster care system, what would it be? With 97% of foster youth not obtaining an undergraduate degree, it is evident that there are substantial barriers in accessing higher education. Throughout the last two decades, advocates have fought tirelessly to eliminate the many barriers to accessing higher education by creating on-campus support services, education and training vouchers to help with educational expenses, and priority registration. But the one thing that we have yet to overcome is the unjust narrative of low expectations. This narrative is one of the many reasons that advanced degree programs are seldom mentioned in conversations regarding access to higher education for foster youth, even though 43.6% of these young people aspire to obtain an advanced degree. Despite this demand, Congress has yet to create any type of federal program that primarily focuses on providing resources to foster youth pursuing advanced degrees. Fortunately, there is an effective solution to this problem. Scholars with lived experience in California decided to take matters into their own hands and created a nonprofit organization known as MAPS, Mentoring for Academic and Professional Success. This program offers services including mentorships, assistance with the application process, financial planning, and ongoing resources for foster youth who are pursuing an advanced degree. As a current MSW student and aspiring law student, I myself have participated in this program, which has been instrumental in helping many foster youth eliminate financial and academic barriers. Due to extremely limited funding, MAPS is a solely volunteer-based organization. However, everyone involved is passionate about keeping these services open to all former foster youth in California in order to create equal educational opportunity. It is essential that we prioritize access to advanced degrees because this is the ultimate form of authentic youth engagement. Creating resources that allow foster youth to become your colleagues with equal decision-making power is imperative to reforming the child welfare system. In an effort to continue funding these existing services and make them available to current and former foster youth throughout the United States, I urge Congress to one, establish a demonstration program through the Department of Education to provide federal funding to statewide nonprofit organizations that offer support services to foster youth pursuing advanced degrees. Two, task the US Department of Education with collecting quantitative and qualitative data on the outcomes of foster youth in advanced degree programs through the National Center for Educational Statistics. And three, direct the Government Accountability Office to research the number and outcomes of current and former foster youth pursuing advanced degree programs. As I sat and prepared for this briefing, I deeply thought about what that one thing would be that I would choose to change within the foster care system. Would it be housing, financial stability, access to education, food security, racial equity? The thing is, I shouldn't have to choose one. You wouldn't make your own child choose just one. That is why I challenge each of you to prioritize child welfare reform so that no child has to choose just one ever again. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Marks, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I had recently graduated from Notre Dame, and I'll be attending Emory Law School this coming fall. When I was 11 years old, I had lost my mother, and my father was arrested for second-degree murder. With no one to care for me at the time, I was placed in foster care, and I stayed until I turned 18. As you can imagine, I was deeply traumatized by the circumstances that brought me into foster care. I had to go to therapy weekly for years. I had constant hospital visits and other immediate and future expenses that I wasn't sure how I'd cover. But I learned that I was eligible for disability benefits 
due to my PTSD and mental illnesses. I also learned that because of my mother's service in Guantanamo Bay during her time in the Navy, I was eligible for more benefits, such as veterans and survivors benefits. I had hope that there were funds I could use to give me the help I truly needed, but that hope was soon crushed. My guardian went with a lawyer and a member from the Navy to attempt to apply for my social security benefits. But there, they were told there was no point in applying because state agencies take foster youth benefits and use them to reimburse themselves for the cost of caring for that foster child. That means that the money I'd get because of my mother's death, her service to the country, and the money I needed to get me immediate assistance would instead be taken by the states. There just wasn't a point of applying anymore. Now, the fear of having my potential benefits taken is not uncommon, as most foster youth currently receiving SSI and OASDI benefits are having their money be taken by state agencies, and some don't even know it. The GAO reported in June that of children receiving these benefits in foster care, the state was a representative payee for 82% of children of foster children, which is troubling since states are supposed to be the last preferred payee possible. State agencies even hire private companies like Maximus to comb through cases to find children who qualify for benefits and apply for the child on their behalf. And agencies have drawn more than $165 million in revenue using these practices. But foster youth like me will likely never see a dime of that money because it's spent on the most basic food and housing, which are expenses that other foster children don't have to pay for. Children in foster care aren't really aware of this practice because the Social Security Administration's notification practices are so outdated. They notify the parent or the legal guardian, which in the case of most foster children is either a parent who is incapable of caring for the child alone or it's the state itself. This is important because if someone could serve as a payee for me later down my life, I wouldn't know because the proper people such as my CASA worker, my lawyer, relatives, or even my caregiver weren't told. Even having a lawyer on my side, it was still so vague if I would even receive the benefits. Overall, this means that despite my mother's service to this country, I, her son, would effectively be paying for my own foster care. It's clear that this system desperately needs a change. And given this reality, I propose three important recommendations to Congress. First, Congress should prohibit state agencies from taking no more than 33% of a child's fo of foster child's SSI and OSDI benefits for food and clothing and other expenses that would normally be covered by child welfare systems. Agencies should reserve the rest for survivor and disability expenses that aren't normally covered by foster care agencies or have the option to place some money in the trust like Maryland. Secondly, Congress should also pass laws requiring that the child's parents, guardians, their lawyers, or other caregivers be notified if a state is using a child's social security benefits annually. And finally, states should disclose their practices for how they notify children that state agencies will be receiving their social security benefits. Thank you so much for your time. I am Janali Merwin. I want to thank my son, Christian, for being my inspiration, the entire team at CCAI, the office of Karen Bass, and lastly, to everyone who believed in me and my son. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, where I entered the foster care system with my one-month-old son at the age of 15. I raised my son in the system until I aged out at 21. I faced tremendous hardships and unsupportive foster homes and child welfare workers that did not understand how to meet my needs as a teenage mother in foster care. The experience was dehumanizing and demoralizing, from moving placement to placement, unaware of my rights, and unable to give my son a home he can call his own. I was constantly stressed out, worrying about how to meet my son's needs while trying to be the best parent I can possibly be. I was able to access foster care services, but because my child was not part of the foster care system, there was little to no support, leaving me to figuring out everything on my own. My unique needs as a parent to you were overlooked at every level of child welfare. More than ever, pregnant parenting youth need connections to a consistent and caring adult to provide guidance and specialized assistance to meet their personal and parental needs. 
When I was in foster care, I was part of a unique program called the Expected Parenting Youth Conference here in Los Angeles. I was assigned to a teen parent resource specialist, Mara Ziegler from Public Council. In these conferences, Mara helped me find my strengths and helped me build a plan for my life. She helped me understand my son's milestones and helped me connect to important resources such as legal counsel, parenting classes, medical, and much more. Mara was my greatest advocate. Another major obstacle I faced was childcare. I was told I was ineligible for all government childcare programs. The eligibility stated that only foster parents can apply and are prioritized for subsidized childcare, but not my status as a teenage mother in foster care. Every child welfare worker told me they were unable to assist me and I felt stuck. However, I was determined to go to college. All on my own, I found a childcare program I was eligible for, Children's Home Society, that stated the government assistance I received during my third trimester prior to entering foster care was my defining moment of receiving childcare. I was fortunate, but no, too many other teen parents were not so lucky. My determination to pursue higher education helped me earn a full ride scholarship to Cal State Fullerton, where I earned my bachelor's degree in human services. This would not have been possible without childcare and the support I received from Mara and many other individuals in my journey. I was able to build a better life for my son and I. It is imperative that we come together as a nation to support these vulnerable families. Here are my recommendations. First, I urge Congress to provide funding to support implementation nationwide to scale up a program similar to LA County's Expectant and Parenting Youth Conference. Second, I urge the US Department of Health and Human Services to issue guidance to child welfare agencies to train staff on the needs of pregnant and parenting youth and their children. Lastly, I urge Congress to pass the Universal Child Care and Early Learning Act to include pregnant and parenting youth in foster care to be eligible for priority subsidized child care. Give teen parents in foster care and their children an opportunity to thrive. Thank you. Greetings, it is an honor to be here virtually and I'm so thankful for this opportunity. My name is Tasha Roberson Wing and I live in Ohio pursuing a master's in social work and a master's in public administration at The Ohio State University. Being a black girl growing up in foster care, I often felt unheard by the individuals who were responsible for my well-being. They were unresponsive to my concerns regarding my safety. I had to continuously advocate for myself by contacting senior leadership at the foster care agency. April 20th, 2021, I found myself downtown Columbus in a parking lot adjacent to a protest being held for Micaiah Bryant. I was drawn to Micaiah. The death of Micaiah Bryant has echoed the cries and focused new attention on the experiences of Black girls in foster care who often feel unheard and unsafe. I, I too have felt unheard, unsafe in my foster care placement. On one occasion, I remember the house phone being removed to silence me from speaking my truth on another being choked and no response. Makai and I both have experienced foster care in our teenage years. Our families would describe us as having big hearts and we both have melanated skin. A disheartened difference is she is dead and I'm alive. Hear me when I say that intersectionality of being black and a young woman poses a unique set of problems for black girls in foster care. Research has revealed that society perceives black girls to appear more adult-like and not as innocent as their white counterparts. The study further explains that Black girls are thought of as needing less nurturing, protection, support, and comfort. Black girls are having to experience an extreme adultification bias and are being perceived as more independent by society, further aiding the disparities in the dispersal of resources. 
Black girls in foster care are also subject to higher rates of residential and school changes, higher disciplinary rates, involvement in the juvenile system, and human sex trafficking. While many of these disparities, disparities negatively affect Black girls in society overall, there is little research to focus on the specific experiences of Black girls in foster care. There are also no specific laws that address the needs for Black girls in care today. Far more information is needed to understand the experiences of Black girls and better tailored foster care services to meet their needs. Congress should require HHS to collect AFGARs by race and ethnicity, gender or sexual orientation, gender identity, and use a NOTS analysis to better understand how intersectionality affects youth involved in the child welfare system. Congress should also request a GAO report to examine the treatment of Black girls in foster care, including their experiences with permanency, safety and well-being, and the interaction with service providers. Finally, the Biden administration should create a federal funded national girl initiative for girls in foster care. If you are still wondering why we should prioritize the needs of Black girls, think about the institution of family. In most families, the parents want their children to have an equal opportunity of living a fulfilled life. Understanding that every child is not the same, parents usually work to understand their children and provide resources to cater to the needs of their children. It is time, please hear me when I say, it is time that Congress stop applying a one size fit all solution and resources to child, children in care. It is time that Congress cultivate data to really understand children in care and their needs. It is time that we prioritize the needs of black girls in foster care to allow equal opportunities to success as other foster youth. That is what equity looks like. That is the conversation we should be happening when we talk about equity and child welfare. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you to um, all of my colleagues here at um, CCAI. Uh, hello again, my name is Cortez Carey, um, and what an amazing opportunity it has been to present to you today. Um, thank you for taking time out to listen to all 11 of our calls to action. As mentioned earlier, we speak for all foster youth who have experienced their own individual traumas as we share our journeys in the foster care system. And we will be so grateful for you to consider these 11 well thought out recommendations for future legislation that can create the change the system is in dire need of. As we may represent 11 success stories, I challenge you to think of the other millions of foster youth who were not as fortunate as we are to have access to resources that helped us create the lives that we live today. Then think about whose lives could be changed with our suggested reform. I must thank a colleague of mine, Michaela, for emphasizing the need to look beyond what meets the eye during these briefings, because there is always another foster youth who desperately needs to be uplifted and given the means to a chance at a better life. You, are who we believe in to make these incredibly enlightened propositions come to fruition. With you backing our informed lived experience, we are one step closer to making a change. Thanks again. And thank you, Cortez, and thank you all students for participating today and giving us these brilliant ideas. For uh, all of you who are watching today and listening, now you understand why the Foster Youth Intern Program is one of the most uh, respected and coveted positions on Capitol Hill, and why we have more congressional offices uh, wanting these interns to help them with policy recommendations than we actually have interns to place. So for all of you, you've given us great um, ideas today. I, I have to say, uh, these are, fresh, new, uh, timely ideas to help us deal with uh, how do we address the racism problems, be it with uh, Black young girls, as you talked about, Tashai, 
for our indigenous uh, foster youth as uh, Chanel and, and Autumn uh, talked about. Uh, you all gave us some great ideas on, on education, uh, what we need to do for, for, to help you achieve your unique goals uh, after high school. Michaela, Janelli, uh, the, the child care assistance that you needed. And Ian, I'd say to you that that money, that social security money, that's for your education. That, that's what that should be used for. Uh, if, if you don't have your own current expenses, as a child that you have to uh, incur them for. Uh, for Layla, I thank you for telling uh, your story, for the boldness and your courage in telling it. And let me assure you, the job of a foster parent, a legal guardian, an adoptive parent, a biological parent, their job is to protect you, the child. Everyone has to do that. And uh, I just, uh, thank you for what you've shared today and how it is going to lead to policy and other programmatic changes to help protect uh, children. And, and for some of you, just such practical ideas like uh, Alan and Cortez, when you're talking about keeping your siblings together and, and you, you're staying with someone who loves you, is taking care of you uh, well, but uh, doesn't have a huge house, will help grandma get a bigger house. That's just too logical. Uh, I think you'll see some action on that as well. And for all the suggestions on training that you give, uh, that you want the counselors to have, to make sure they understand how to deal with the trauma that you face, that, that is the kind of training that we need school counselors and teachers to have. So thank you today for your suggestions, your, uh, congressmen and senators who you've worked for this summer are going to take these and run. You may not see it for a few years, but uh, these ideas will happen. I can say that because I've watched uh, the young men and women before you do the same, gives great recommendations, and some of those have become law or implemented through regulation. Finally, I want to say, uh, I want to thank the people who did hire you this summer and gave you the opportunity to work directly for them. We're, we're sorry that uh, it was virtual rather than showing up in the Capitol buildings every day, but uh, your work is nonetheless uh, critical for children in foster care and those administering the programs. So we thank those on the, on the committees that have a lot of jurisdiction over uh, foster care, the Finance and Ways and Means Committee, uh, Chairman Ron Whiting at Wyden from Oregon, the ranking member Kevin Brady from Texas on the House side, other senators who, who serve on those committees, Bob Menendez and Representative da Danny Davis. Uh, and then you met Richard Blumenthal and Sharice Davids today. We thank them, along with other House members who stepped up and gave you an opportunity. Representative Karen Bass from California, Representative Donald Norcross from New Jersey, Representative Dean Phillips from Minnesota and Representative Abigail Spansberger from Virginia. Thank you all. Now it's time uh, to engage. And uh, students, we're gonna ask you for one more thing. We're gonna ask you to answer some questions. So Taylor, how are we doing this? Sure, thanks so much, Russ. And um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Taylor Drady. I'm the Senior Director of Policy at CCAI, and I have the honor and privilege of working alongside these amazing individuals for the past uh, two summers. Um, they continue to inspire me every day, and I truly hope that all of we will dig into their report. Um, we do want to open it up for a question and answer period um, to a specific in, in FYI, or if you have more of a group question, um, that's fine as well. Um, the way typically that we ask is you can either um, ask your question in the chat, or um, if you'd like to raise your hand, I will call on you as well. We also, as Russ mentioned, had so many amazing host offices this summer, and while we were joined um, by two members, there was also um, some members that did send in some remarks that they asked to be shared um, at the briefing. So I am first um, going to share um, my screen with you all um, so you can hear a um, recorded 
uh, remarks from um, Senator Wyden, if I can figure my screen out one second. Okay, the video doesn't seem to be opening right now, but let's just pop on for one question and answer while I um, while I get that video up and running. Um, it looks like we do have some questions um, in the Q and A. Um, I think the first one from Jessica Ackerman. Um, did you want to ask your question? Um, I, it seems like it's specifically for Layla Rose. Um, Jessica, did you want to go and answer your question? I think Kate will allow your um, microphone to work. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So before anything else, I really wanted to thank everyone for being so candid and being so descriptive. I'm full disclosure, a law student working in a public defender's office, and I always strive to be as understanding as possible, but it's not always something that someone from the quote unquote outside is equipped to do. And I think that even just attending this for the 38 minutes or so that I've been here has been phenomenal. So my question is specifically for Leila Rose, but if anyone else kind of wants to jump in with a question, that'd be awesome. Um, so um, Leila Rose had mentioned um, ombudsman and I guess I'm just kind of wondering why it's specifically important for this, I guess, hypothetical or to be created office to be, like I believe you said, independent and youth specific. Sure, um, I would love to tackle that and I will do it um, in two parts. So first, the most important is that the Ombudsman Office is youth centered. And this is because other there have been offices, um, state Ombudsman offices that um, do cater to adults, they do serve adult populations. And what happens in those situations is you often see them only serving adult populations. Um, so it really just becomes yet another resource for adults and not one for youth. And um, that's been problematic in several states where they've had uh, ombudsmen that applied to both youth and adults. Secondly, it's important for the office to be independent to avoid any conflicts of interest. Um, so what I mean by independent is not necessarily under the direct control of the state's main um, child welfare agency, whether it would whether it's housed, you know, in the state's Department of Justice or what have you, just separate so that um, youth may be more likely to trust it as not being perceived as on the same team, if you will, as perhaps some of the people they are speaking out against, such as uh, foster parents or social workers or what have you. Um, so those two things, and in Texas, we found that where they have an ombudsman office that is both youth centered and independent, they've had quite a lot of success with uh, 200, around 250 substantiated maltreatment reports in 2019. So um, we've seen this model work before and there's no need for states to reinvent the wheel. It's just a best practice. Great, thank you so much for your question, Jessica. I am gonna go ahead and attempt um, this video clip now. Just give me one second from Senator Wyden. Yep. 
Okay, we apologize if the sound um, was breaking up there, um, but definitely wanted to share Senator Wyden's message um, to our Boston Youth Internship class. Um, we do have some time for some more questions. Um, there um, is a question in the chat, and this looks like for any FYI, if um, you want to take it, do you feel that advocacy for foster youth um, starts inside or outside of care? Anyone want to, want to take that question? Um, maybe some to um, who've experienced extended foster care. Um, I guess I can speak to it. So I would say that it can occur um, in both. Um, I feel like my foster care advocacy, my initial foster care advocacy started about two years ago through uh, the National Foster Youth Institute Shadow Day, uh, where they choose 100 former foster youth from all over the country. And you go to Capitol Hill and you shadow a member of Congress. Um, so that's sort of where my advocacy journey started, but there were also a lot of opportunities for me when I came back to the state of New Jersey. So um, I'm a youth ambassador for the Department of Children and Families, and I speak to uh, current um, and potential foster parents about the misconceptions of foster youth and things like that, and just like my experience in care. Um, and then I also serve on um, my youth council that works directly with um, DCF Commissioner Beyer. Um, and we are doing amazing things like redesigning um, a resource website and building an app um, we have completely redone the foster parent trainings um, and um, rewritten sibling bill of rights, things like that. And then also like this FYI program and a few other things. But I think in it, it can occur both when you're in the system and out of the system. But yeah, if anyone else would like to add. Awesome, thanks Haley. Janelle, did you wanna add as well? Yeah, I would like to add on um, that it, I agree with Haley, it could occur both ways. And I think it starts with aware, awareness, um, bringing awareness to the lived experiences of those that are in foster care. And you do not necessarily have to have lived experience to care. It just, it just has to start with um, knowing that we have children um, who have experienced abuse and who are being um, torn from their families and who are placed in a system that they have no idea what to expect and what they're going to experience. And more than ever, we need caring adults to be in the lives of these vulnerable youth um, because the lives of foster youth are shaped by our connections. And Ultimately, we cannot make it without you. We cannot make it without the resources. And it takes a platform like this, listening to our voices, um, that shows that you all are part of trying to be a part of the solution. Um, so I think it goes both ways. And for those that are in lived experiences, I feel like we definitely 
uh, need to educate more foster youth on their rights, have them understand what are current laws that are impacting them and why are different things happening. And I think once we have a clear understanding of what they are, um, it's an easier route to navigate the system just a little easier. And I know personally for me, um, just many different policies has impacted my life and it's what has helped me get to where I'm at today. Thanks, Janelle. And Autumn, do you want to um, answer as well? Yeah, I just wanted to add on that while in the system, I didn't really actively advocate. It was more so when I came upon the time to start fighting to gain custody of my brother and sister that I started advocating and I took that step on. So that um, time span when I was 19, fighting for the guardianship of my brother and sister really taught me what advocacy can do because it's allowed me to change their lives the same way my grandmother changed mine. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Autumn. We have another question in the chat from um, Dr. J.P. Horn. Um, seems like it is for Michaela. Um, J.P., did you want to go and ask your question? Hello, sorry, I was like, I've never been on this side of the screen, uh, waiting for that unmute button to pop up. Hello everyone, it's so good to see all of you uh, and I'm very excited, I love coming to the report. Um, so my question for Michaela is, um, so the way that we know how many foster youth are in college in the United States is that we have a data set with, that's housed by the Department of Education, the National Center for Educational Statistics, right? And we get that data from the FAFSA. But graduate students don't always fill out the FAFSA. And even if they do fill out the FAFSA, most of the time, because they're considered independent, they don't really have to go through the whole workflow. So I'm wondering if we think it might be important for universities themselves to actually keep track of that data. Because universities have to report on other data, why can't we also ask them to report on foster youth data? Thank you so much for raising this question. Um, I do have a two part answer. So my first, so in this um, research and cultivation of this report, we did explore multiple avenues of um, this exact concept. And so one of the conclusions I came up with was just the importance of keeping that question on the FAFSA because a majority of foster youth that are attending graduate schools um, usually do need to take out loans because of those financial barriers. So making that a requirement independent of independent status would be influential so that that data is automatically put into the National Center for Educational Statistics. Um, the second part to my answer would be that we know that schools most of the time, once an applicant self discloses that they are a former foster youth, they're collecting that data, especially for grant purposes. Um, and so having that formalized place where they can input that data is instrumental in collecting this as well as making it a required um, question, required formalized questions on all grad school and professional program applications. So creating a separate um, entity within the US Department of Education in that National Center for Educational Statistics would be really instrumental in collecting this data. So yes, I do agree with you. Great. Thank you for your question, JP. Um, we have some other questions as well um, from Audrey at First Focus. What do you see um, is the biggest challenge to implementing your recommendations and how can the advocacy community help overcome them? Do you all have any recommendations? So oh, honestly, I think my, for me personally, my biggest challenge has been just, I guess, um, trying to properly word this, is just being honest about the disparities that um, Black people face in America and the 
systemic issues like we can't address the problem of how black girls are experiencing these disparities if we believe everyone is equal so having an honest conversation about the this the narrative that is really taking place and the barriers that are really hindering black girls and i think also just being honest the current climate of government and politics, the um, lack of wanting to work with each other across the aisle is really hindering some of the progress in terms of these children. So I think one way to continue um, trying to overcome some of these barriers is this really putting yourself in position to have honest conversation. Like just being honest, having those difficult conversations with members of Congress, with staff, and coming from a place that we're trying to learn from each other. Thank you, Tasha. Isabel? Uh, yeah, just to emphasize what Tasha was saying, um, you know, when you bring up these heavy topics, and mind you, all of our recommendations kind of dive into some pretty heavy stuff. But I think right now, with I don't want to say like the political climate, but that's part of it. I think there's such like a heavy conversation about race. Um, and sometimes people just don't want to get into it because they're afraid um, that it will be too messy. And I think what Tasha was saying, coming at it in this way of open mindedness and open heartedness and just like truly listening, because yeah, these like numbers and statistics and all this data is really it can be really disheartening, but going into it and listening and being like, okay, yes, this exists. I wish this didn't exist, but it does exist. And just acknowledging that I think is a beautiful and powerful thing. And so uh, coming into these conversations and not immediately dismissing it, I think that's definitely the first step. So just echoing Tasha on that one for sure. Thanks, Isabel. And I think this kind of goes with another question that we had um, in the chat um, from CCAI's founding executive director, Carrie Hossenbog, is, you know, writing these recommendations and, you know, publishing this report, does it give you all a sense of, you know, hope that, you know, we can, you know, move forward and have those honest conversations and, and really talk about change and reform? Leila Rose, do you want to go? Sure. So um, I think just generally, you know, her asking if this gave us a sense of relief. I think I've been waiting a long time to tell this story and I've been waiting for the right moment and the right platform. And I think that I am very relieved that I was able to do it in this way and um, really use something that could have been, you know, so horrible and ugly to really um, affect change in such a monumental way. And I think that the time is now, you know, people are looking at ch uh, child welfare reform now more than ever. And I'm so thankful that I got to do this and that I got this platform to tell that story. So yes, I'm definitely relieved. Thank you, Leila Rose. Looks like we have another question um, in the chat as well. Um, you know, after, you know, you all spending two summers um, doing incredible work, publishing two policy reports in the midst of all the craziness that's going on in the world, um, you know, is there, uh, a highlight of your time as a FOSS youth intern that anyone wants to share? Uh, Isabel? I think there's been so many highlights, but I think I would be remiss to not mention that despite being virtual, I really feel like our cohort was able to connect with one another and like just really get to know each other. And I think of all, like everyone um, that I've worked with and how just like the funny witty things that they would say and just like little ways we've gotten to know each other. And so I think that that connection uh, is still alive. Um, a lot of people have been like, oh, it's a bummer you weren't in person and I agree. But I think like we've still made these beautiful connections and uh, bonding over really important and meaningful stuff. And then also just kind of being silly with one another. So yeah, that has been my highlight. Awesome. 
So I think my highlight is just um, when I was working on my report, I like was so scared. And I'll be honest, because I'm I'm a transparent person. I was so scared to mention Makai Bryant's name because I knew it would come with a host of other issues. And I think the highlight for me was just working with Rebecca and Taylor and not necessarily getting validation for them, but just encouragement to like tell my truth. And if I can add one more, it was meeting with Congresswoman Bass. Um, I interned in her office and she inspired me so much to use an empathetic lens to policy. And so going to grad school to have like the social work lens to apply to policy and now being able to write a policy report and use that lens has been phenomenal in like encouraging a vision that I had. So thank you. And thanks for sharing, Tasha. Uh, Janelle, did you want to share? Yeah, I'd like to share. Um, so there has been quite a few different highlights. And I just want to say, like, I'm really appreciative of the support that I received from everyone from CCAI who really do incredible work to help us uplift our voices and elevate them to the highest level possible, which is, you know, presenting to you all and with Congress. And I feel like one highlight that um, sticks out to me is just the educating part, like educating others on our lived experience and kind of goes in hand with the earlier question, like doing advocacy within. And it's important to hear from the youth firsthand, what did they experience and what did what needs to be changed? And um, with the different members that I've been able to speak to in particular with my topic, pregnant and parenting youth, um, I've been able to educate others that like, while in the US that there has been a decline in teen pregnancy, it hasn't been the same with those in foster care. There has, has been a significant number of youth who are um, girls who are becoming pregnant by the age of 21, um, which is 71%. And we see that um, one of, uh, we see that going on. And I feel like um, it was uh, Miss Bass that we had talked to and she wasn't aware of that. And I think like, it just felt very um, empowering to share knowledge um, from firsthand experience and to share like what needs to be changed and like, what do we need to do to support our youth? So I feel like that's been like the highlight of this. So thank you. Thank you, Janelle. Alan? I would definitely say that the highlight is working and growing alongside my colleague. And this program has really also forced me to be okay with being uncomfortable at times. Um, I recognize that, you know, as a former or current adoptive youth, um, my family is very much split up and a lot of my memories of my family and what has happened in separate foster homes is split up. And this program really like, gives me an opportunity to really order it all and not only like order it all, but like then take my experiences and, and be able to teach. And I think that is like, that's a beautiful thing when you can take some of your darkest moments and shed light on them. So other people can also do the same thing. It's kind of like a pathway and they know I love my pathways to gardens, but that's kind of like <laughs> what, it's, what it's really like. You take a bunch of these like pebbles and stones and things that aren't as like beautiful and you slowly like stack and build upon them and you know, you, you have a walkway and I think that's, that's beautiful. Great, well, um, I know that we are coming up on the 4.30 Eastern time hour. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close us out. I apologize for the technical difficulties, um, sharing more of our host office um, videos that they sent their best wishes um, to this class as their report is released. We'll go ahead and share those on our social media so um, all can see. But um, again, we at CCAI, we really just want to congratulate this class for publishing an amazing re report with innovative um, policy recommendations that will continue um, to be pushed out this week. They have a lot of great meetings lined up um, to share the report. And we encourage you all 
all um, to share as well. Um, but we cannot put this report on alone. Um, our friends at Child Focus um, really help us um, finalize this report. So I want to give a big, big thank you to the team at Child Focus. Thank you for all you do. And we also, um, each FYI, has a policy report advisor that really helps them along the way. And just want to give a huge thanks um, to all 11 policy report advisors this summer. Um, you can find um, all of um, their names in the policy report um, book, but just want to thank you all for um, helping publish this report and working alongside this incredible class. Um, and a big thanks again to our partners. We could not do this um, without you. So thank you everyone for joining today. Congratulations to the 2021 class of foster youth interns, and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you.